Hey, stay standing. Stay standing for a moment. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We do. We worship your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, this moment, Lord, to be gathered as your people in your presence, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to open up the word of God this morning, which is filled with your promises. And Lord, right now, in advance, God, we say we are here to hear from you. What do you have to say? What do you want to speak? What do you want to do? What do you want to impart to every person, every man of God, every woman of God, every young adult, every person that's joining us online remotely, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that your heart today is to heal, to strengthen, to restore, to bring new hope, to bring fresh faith, God, for the future that we have in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you'll grab a hold of any part of that for you and your marriage, your family. Come on, say amen, amen, amen. And put your hands together for Jesus this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Man, was a worship good this morning. You can be seated. On your way down, tell someone you're glad that they're here today. And I want to also welcome those of you who are joining us online. Thank you for making time to worship Jesus with us and grow in your faith. And hey, if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn to Colossians chapter 3. And be patient, we'll get there here in a moment. We're going to continue. We're starting to land our series called God's Prescription. Thank you for having some grace for me as I continue to battle some issues with my eye. I don't know if you're sure if you can see that again this morning. I, I, I covered your prayers, taking all the steps that they're asking me to take. And one of the next steps could even be a minor procedure on my eye. So thank you for prayers that the Lord would just continue to heal and restore me so I can avoid that procedure. Listen, I, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm thankful. I, I'm seeing more clearly my vision has returned. To, uh, to, full, to full capacity, but just still dealing with some lingering things here. So thank you for your prayers. I covet that this morning. And listen, it touches on what I want to talk to you about this morning, just having an attitude of gratitude, a spirit of thankfulness, and all that that entails, and all that it protects us from and leads us into in God's kingdom. And listen, God's prescription, this whole series has been about, Lord, what's your pattern? What's your prescription for life? In a culture where there are increasing and varying opinions about how to do life, Lord, what does your word have to say about every area of life? That's the prescription that we want to apply to our life. That's the prescription that we want to not only fill but begin to, to take God's medicine, to begin to walk out God's word. And Proverbs 4.20 has been a key scripture for us, a foundational scripture, and it says this, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. They are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Amen. When you find God's word, when you get God's prescription, there's a measure of things that you can find in the world, but they're often fleeting and circumstantial. God's word is the only firm foundation, unshakable thing that you can build your life, your marriage, your family, and your future upon. So come on, let's get into God's word this morning. Colossians chapter 3, and there's a couple verses that I wanted to pull. In fact, I went to, to read this chapter to pull those verses, and I read the whole chapter, and I just felt like I couldn't help myself but from reading a little bit more of this chapter, so rich so full, so much. I trust that there's something that as we read, kind of driving down to get to the couple of verses that I'm intending to bring into this topic today, that there's something that the Lord's going to speak to you through this. And just a powerful, rich chapter. You'll see what I mean. Many, many, maybe of you, many, many of you maybe already are aware of just how rich and deep this chapter is. Starting in verse 1, Colossians chapter 3, and it says this, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life, somebody say my real life, is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all, someone say all, his glory. That's a good promise. So, to, so put to death the sinful, earthful things Earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. 
Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature, be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, the new life, come on, that Jesus has saved us to and called us to, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for one another's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, somebody say one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Always. And always, always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all of its richness, let, it, let that message fill your lives. He wants to fill your life today. The message of Christ, come on, God is not an attachment to a life that you live in the world. He, he wants to be your all-consuming purpose and source. Let, let the message of the gospel fill your life. Teach and counsel one another with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Listen, I want to talk to you today about one of the most powerful, life-altering prescriptions from God. I'm just telling you, if there's one thing that I can impart to people there was one thing that I could just get people to grasp because this thing, this one thing, this one principle, this one command from God is life-changing, it's life-altering, it's a game-changer, it affects marriages, it affects relationships, it affects minds and hearts, it helps people to be insulated from the attacks and the schemes of the enemy, it keeps us moving forward towards the plans and the purposes of God in our life. I want to talk to you about living a life of thankfulness about having an attitude of gratitude. And listen, I know that rhymes, but it really is powerful to remember this because attitude is important. Listen, I said this last week, that you cannot control oftentimes the things that happen to you, but you get the opportunity. You can always determine what you call those things. You, you experience what the world would call a failure. You get the opportunity to say, Lord, thank you for this learning opportunity. I'm going to be better off. And when I get to the other side, when I build the business, when I, when I get the relationship, whatever I learn through this, what the world would call a failure, I thank you that you are teaching me. You are, you, are, you are raising me. You are preparing me. You don't get the opportunity to determine what happens in your life, but you always get the opportunity for what you will call it delay something you thought would happen. Lord, thank you. It's a season of preparation. You know, you see what I can't see. You're preparing me to be a better steward of what that is that you're about to deliver me to. Disappointment. You get a chance to call it. God's protection. God's redirection. God's better plan connection. So you can't always control or determine what happens in your life. Last week I said you get a chance to determine what you call it. This week I want to say this. You can't always control or determine the things that are going on around you but you can always determine the attitude that you will have about it. Amen. Attitude, attitude, the attitude of gratitude. I see Terry Marshall sitting here. He had a career in, in aeronautic testing of gauges and, and things having to do with the, 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 the workings of airplanes. And, and attitude is an aeronautical term. And it has to do with the direction of the plane, whether the, the nose, the pitch of the aircraft, it, its attitude speaks to, to the direction of the aircraft relative to the horizon. And so here's what attitude does in an aeronautical sense. It determines whether the plane is ascending or descending. And I think it's powerfully true and prophetically true that in many ways your attitude is determining whether you are ascending or descending. I'm just telling you, your attitude about your marriage is determining your attitude about your children, your attitude about your church, your attitude about your nation, your attitude about God. I'm just telling you, your attitude is determining whether you are ascending or descending in many areas of your life. Come on, how many of you know it's true today? Someone say amen. amen. 
attitude of gratitude. But you know, there's, I think there's something about going beyond attitude to action, especially as it re- regards being thankful. Because thankfulness has to be expressed. Thankfulness needs to be expressed. Yeah, maybe an attitude of gratitude without actions of gratitude is kind of like faith without works. It's not fully alive. It's good to have faith, but God says, you can have faith, you can believe in God, but he said, I've called you to live a life for God. And maybe going beyond an attitude of gratitude, which is the place to start for sure, to actually saying, Lord, now from that place where I've gathered and I've I've apprehended and I've protected and I valued this attitude of gratitude, now what's it look like for me to begin to live a life that expresses my gratitude to you for all that you've done, for who you are, for what you've done, for for what you've saved me from, from what you've rescued me from, from what you've preserved me from. For the things that you've blessed me with that I never could have earned or deserved. Lord, towards the people around me in my life, what's it look like for me to move beyond an attitude of gratitude or a perspective, a mindset, to actually saying, Lord, now what's it look like for me to take another step in maturity of walking this out and living this out to begin to walk in activity of gratitude? Psalm 107.2 says this, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. Let the redeemed. Who? Those who have been redeemed of the Lord. Listen, look at this. That that comes from Psalm 107. Let's back up and let's read a little bit more of it, starting in verse 1. That was verse 2, so I'll reread that verse. But verse 1 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Somebody say, give thanks. For he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. For whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now, as we're reading this, just find a few places that maybe are applicable to your life. Or maybe find a few places that maybe you're walking through something today. Because I'm just telling you, watch. Again, the context is let the redeemed of the Lord speak up. Let them say so. Let them worship. Let them praise. Let them, let them not just thank God in their heart, but let them outwardly begin to express the gratitude to God for who he is and for what he has done. So let the redeemed, the redeemed, are you redeemed? Are you redeemed? Come on, who's redeemed? Who, who am I preaching to this morning who's been redeemed? Man, I'm so thankful that I've been redeemed. And he says, whom, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, gathered out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, those who wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way, who found no city in which to dwell, hungry and thirsty, their souls fainting within them. But then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. He led them forth by the right way so that they might go into a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks. Say, give thanks. To the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul. The longing soul who's here and you're longing today. You're longing for something that will not leave you thirsting. He fills the hungry soul with goodness. Those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death bound, bound in affliction and in irons because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. Who has a heavy heart today? And they fell down. There was none to help. But then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death. He broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks. Somebody say give thanks. To the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that somebody would give thanks. Let the redeemed, come on, if you were lost, if you were, if you were bound, if he's rescued you out, if he's, if he's filled your heart, if he's brought refreshing to your life or your marriage, whatever he's done in your life, he says, let the redeemed say so. Let them begin to express their gratitude. It's why we gather, and it's before we get into God's word, typically is our pattern. It's why we gather, we worship the Lord, and we say thank you. We sing that song this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done. And you see me up here every Sunday, and I'm doing my white pastor pogo thing that I do. And I'm, if, what you can't see is oftentimes there's a tear in my eye. And I'm not worshiping and thanking God because I'm a pastor. I'm worshiping God because I was once a prisoner. Oh, if you could only see. 
Where would I be without you? Man, I, you don't want to know. <laughs> Let the redeemed, those who have been saved, healed, rescued, restored, renewed, those who were longing, who were hoping, who were dreaming, who were perishing and they found life in Christ. Let the redeemed of the Lord begin to say so. Being thankful, come on, going beyond an attitude of gratitude to a lifestyle of active, actively worshiping and praising and giving thanks. It's not just good Christian behavior. It's a powerful spiritual weapon. It's a powerful spiritual weapon. I'm about to show you it protects us and it directs us. You remember the people of Israel who... God delivered by his mighty hand from the captivity that they were experiencing in Egypt under the hand of, Mo, of Pharaoh, whether where they had been crying out, Lord, how long would you, until you rescue us, how long until you rescue us? And God showed up and he rescued them. And then just a few miles down the road, they were grumbling and complaining, saying, it would have been better for us to die in Egypt. At least there we had three square meals. And God had shown up in their life and rescued them and and, and, and listen, I'm just telling you, this is a powerful principle that you need to hold on, hang on to. And I'm grateful that we live in the age of grace. I mean, I'm grateful that even when I grumble and I complain, come on, I'm still on my way to heaven. But I'm telling you, I think there's something that applies to our lives still today. And that is that we don't experience, we don't step into the fullness of the promises of God when we allow the enemy of our soul to come and cause us to become disgruntled, grumbling and complaining towards God, towards our spouse, towards our church, towards our neighbor, whatever it is. Because here's what Numbers 14 said that, let me just read it to you. Because you have grumbled against me, surely none of you will enter the land in which I swore to settle you. And that's exactly what happened. Except it goes on to say, except for Joshua and Caleb, because they had a different spirit. And you remember Joshua and Caleb when they encountered some of the problems, some of the pitfalls, some of the giants that were in the land of the promise. They came back and they didn't disregard those things. They didn't just kind of uh, ignore those things. They came back and acknowledged those things, but they said, surely our God will see us through. They had a different spirit. Come on, maybe God's looking for you to walk with a different spirit today. A spirit that, that, that can give thanks even in the midst of difficulties and trials, even in the midst of opposition for the promises of God because you know where God has brought you from and you know he's not going to let you down until he sees you through and sees you to the promises of God for every area of your life. Someone ought to say amen. amen. It's a powerful spiritual weapon. It's not just good Christian behavior. It's not just manners that we teach our kids. I mean, we should. We ought to. I mean, come on, man. Who just wants to hear thank you for dinner or for... The, doing the laundry or whatever, I mean, I mean, come on. But it's more. There's a, there's a powerful spiritual principle here. Here we go, I'm gonna dig in just a few things. These are some things that if you'll grab a hold of an attitude of gratitude, if you'll allow the Lord to restore that to you, if maybe there's a new revelation you'll get today about why this is important, and if you'll begin to walk it out because the Bible says that we are called to not just be hearers, but doers of God's word, if we'll begin to put this into practice, moving beyond the attitude to the activity, just watch. These are just a few. I could preach on this for hours. I'm not going to today. Someone say amen. But these are just a few things that at grabbing a hold of this will do in you, for you, and through you. Number one, be, living an attitude of gratitude towards God, towards the people in your life, is the pathway to experience more of God's presence. Psalm 95 verse 2 says, let us come before him with what? Thanksgiving. Psalm 100, verse 4, just turn the page a few pages over to the right, and it says, enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. There's a lot of things that he could have said there. There's a lot of things that are applicable with reverence, with, with awe, with fear, with trembling, with whatever, with love. He said, enter into my gates, come before me with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and, and, and praise his holy name. Listen, God is giving you some insider information here. And again, the point that we're unpacking is that an attitude of gratitude, giving thanks to God in every season is the pathway to experience more of God's presence. This is some insider information because, listen, you got to catch this today. God's a jealous God. Exodus 34 tells us that his name is Jealous. He's a jealous God. It means all the things of the world that have your time and your affection and your attention. He said, man, I, I just wish I had an hour with my daughter. Oh, man, I just, I just wish that, I just wish that my, my son would turn to me when he gets in a tight spot. 
I'm convinced that maybe God actually created social media and there's a timer in heaven counting all the videos that I'm watching on YouTube to kind of disprove when I get there and say I was too busy to go on the mission field or do the thing that God's called me to do. He's going to point and say, well, you watched 8,000 hours of fishing videos. (laughs) (laughs) Or hunting videos, that's for you, Pastor Micah. Or golfing videos, that's for these folks right here. (laughs) Or cat videos, I don't know who the cat people are here. (laughs) He's a jealous God. He wants your time, he wants your heart, he wants your attention, he wants your affection. But he's the furthest thing from selfish. So he's giving you some insider information here. saying, you want to come into my presence? You want to enter into my court? You want to go beyond just kind of a casual issue? You want to experience more of me? Ooh, come before me with thankfulness. Thankfulness. This is not because of what it does for God. God, let me feel you know something. God does not have self-esteem issues. He knows that this is a pattern that postures our heart to receive from God. It's the attitude, the posture, the perspective that positions us and allows the blessing of God to be most readily released into your life. He's jealous for your time, your attention, your affection, but he's anything but selfish. He's giving you some inside information. Come before me. I'm telling you, every day when you hit the floor, when your feet hit the floor, when you have your prayer time, when you open your Bible, we ought to come before him with thanksgiving. I mean, every day, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the breath that's filling my lungs. Thank you that I'm stepping out of this bed into a new day. I've got some challenges. But there are some people who are not getting the blessing or the benefit or the privilege of even having the opportunity to go and address those challenges today. And, ooh, I'm thankful for that, God. Thank you for my my wife, for my kids. Thank you for my boss. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my... My car, it needs new tires, and the air conditioner's not working, but I'm grateful for it. I'm, as I drive by the bus stop and see the 8 or 12 people kind of sitting there waiting in the heat for the bus to pick them up and take them to their job that they don't make nearly as much as me, I'm just grateful. I'm thankful, Lord. Thank you that when I'm waking up, I'm thinking about you, and I, I've got some challenges. I, I haven't arrived yet, but I'm, I'm mindful of your hand upon my life. I'm thankful for the way you saved me and rescued me, and I know That because of what you've done before in my life, you're going to remain faithful to preserve and protect and direct and provide for me and my family every area of my life today. I mean, come on, I'm just thankful. I'm just telling you, I think that gets the attention of God. Come before me with thanksgiving. Enter my courts with praise. It's the pathway to experience more of God's presence. Come on, who's willing to grab a hold of just taking a step? taking a step today to just begin to take it from attitude to action, to begin to express your gratitude towards God. Come on, who's willing and able to say, God, grace me, Lord, to be more mindful, to be more thankful? Number two, it creates the ultimate atmosphere of faith over your life, your hopes, your dreams, your needs, your desires, your wants, your challenges. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6, we visited it recently, we're visiting it. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Someone say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, and here's a prescription for you right here from God, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. So it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Listen, again, God is, he's jealous for our time, affection, and attention, but he's not selfish. So this is, again, this is insider information. He's saying, Go ahead and present the thing that you have, the challenge you're up against, the need that you have, the bills that you need to pay, the opportunity, the door that you need to see open, the healing that you need in your body, the relationship that you need to be restored. He said, go ahead and present that to me, giving me thanks that I'm going to take care of it. And here's what it does. It creates, it blows out the middle ground of doubt and unbelief. 
When you present that thing and you say, Lord, I thank you that you are going to meet this need, heal the, the thing, rescue the person, restore the thing, whatever it is, thank you, Lord, that you are going to do it. And it puts you in the posture of faith, and faith is what pleases God. And we don't have to. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't have to grovel and beg and plead. Listen, I know you can ask and seek and knock, but I'm telling you, God's giving us a prescription right here. He's saying, go ahead and bring every situation, every need, everything that you have in your heart, your dreams, your desires, your hopes, your challenges. Go ahead and present them before me with thanksgiving. That's what he says. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. It creates the ultimate atmosphere of faith. And faith is what pleases God. Faith is what moves the heart of God. I'm just telling you, he's a good father. That need that you're presenting with thankfulness, he cares about it much more than you do. And it moves the heart of the father. It, it, it creates the atmosphere of faith when we come before him and we say, Lord, I thank you that you're going to meet this need. It allows us to experience more of God's presence. It creates the ultimate atmosphere of faith. Number three, giving thanks, an attitude of gratitude, living thankful, protects relationships from division and divorce. Every relationship, your marriage, with, your, with people at church, in your workplace, I'm telling you, if you'll protect and fiercely defend the atmosphere of gratitude over that relationship, it will insulate you from division and divorce. Because I'm, you don't wake up one day on the brink of divorce or division from people. And I'm using that word divorce. It's not just applicable to marriage. I mean a separation, a cutting off, an ending of a relationship, whatever relationship that is. You don't wake up on the brink of divorce overnight. You drift there through unhealed offenses, wounds, misunderstandings. You drift there. I mean, I'm telling you, when... I know that, that marriage can't always be a honeymoon, but what if you decided to daily defend the attitude of gratitude for that person in your life? And anytime I touch on this, it's always good to just quickly say, because so many people, because there's such an attack on marriage and family, so many people have dealt with this and walked through this, and you, if you knew what you knew now, maybe you could go back, but listen, there's forgiveness, there's grace, and God is always looking to redeem and restore. It's never too late to do the right thing and just take what he's done in your life, what he's written in your life, and say, from this point forward with whoever it is that now is in my life, I am going to begin to walk this out in a way that allows me to, to insulate and protect that relationship which is important to God. It matters to God, so it matters to me from division and divorce. I'm telling you, protect, fiercely defend the attitude of gratitude for your spouse for your church, for your pastors, for, for your boss. I mean, I'm just telling you, just, just remind yourself. And, and, and again, I don't, I, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but there's someone, there's, there's, a, there's a relationship, there's a couple here today, and there's a bright future that God has for you in your marriage, but there is a strategic assignment and attack from the enemy that is underway right now. And I'm telling you, grab a hold of this and begin to, to, to look for, to mine for, to go back to that place. I'm reminded of the book of Revelation where the angel of the Lord comes and he says, go back and begin to do the deeds that will restore your first love. Go back and begin to mine for those things. Take yourself back to that place where you got off track and you allowed the disappointment or the disagreement or the real challenge, the real shortcoming that the person has that caused you to begin to focus more of your attention and your energy on those things than all the things that caused you to fall desperately in love with that person. Go back to that place. Go back to that place. Go back to that place. And begin to do what, what God's word says right here. Whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, even if you got to look hard for it, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The enemy is always trying to get our attention on our weaknesses, our shortcomings. And listen, it's, it, there, there might be some real weaknesses, real challenges, real shortcomings, 
Can I tell you that the attitude, the atmosphere of gratitude is the atmosphere that often leads to change. I mean, it was true with us. It was the kindness of God. God didn't beat us over the head with the Ten Commandments to get us to change. He came and laid down his life. That's what led us into a relationship that wanted to know him and serve him. I'm just telling you, people are rarely pestered into change. And, 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 don't, and don't miss this, they really need to change. But maybe God's, again, he's giving us some insider information today. Maybe you go back and you say, Woo, man, that, he, that really needs to change. But in the midst of that, what's it look like for me to begin to mine for, to look for the things that are lovely and pure and right and praiseworthy and excellent? I'm going to begin to go and I'm going to begin to express. I'm going to begin to speak, even if it takes the grace of God, which he will give you to do the things that seem impossible to your flesh. He'll empower you by his spirit. I'm going to go and I'm going to begin to speak those things over them in such a way that they might even say, who are you and what have you done with my wife or my husband or whatever? Watch when you do it with consistency and you do it with the heart of God, not to manipulate, but just to honor the word of the Lord and be obedient to walk it out. Just watch how it begins to invite the presence of God into the situation. It protects relationships. It's a pathway to experience more of God's presence. It creates the ultimate atmosphere of faith over our request. It protects relationships from division and Divorce. Number four, it keeps us moving forward towards God's plans and purposes for our life. His will for your life. How many of you would like to know God's will for your life? It's one of the most common questions that people say, what has God created me to do? What's his will for my life? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, you might have expected me to go here in this message, says this, rejoice always, say always, pray continually, and give thanks. I mean, look, come on, here's another prescription from God. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. Pastor T, you're always telling us God has a big plan, a big dream, a bright hope, a good future for us. Surely it's got to be more than this. Listen, he does, and it is. Ephesians 3 says, him, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, that's a lot of more. <laughs> than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work, in us, he, he'll do more than what, than what we ask or imagine. God's part is to bring the more. Our part is to begin to ask, to think, to dream, to imagine. You establish the floor for God's more. But the way to discover the hope, the dream, the plan, the breakthrough that God has for you is to, it's found in this scripture. I'm gonna rejoice always, I'm gonna pray continually, and in every circumstance, I'm going to be thankful. Ooh, that seems impossible. You mean in every circumstance, Pastor T, I gotta remain thankful? You know what I appreciate about this is it says in, not for. I'm going through the thing. I'm not thankful for the thing. I'm just thankful that I know a God who's going to get me to the other side of the thing. In the thing. Not for the thing. I'm not thankful for the eye issue I'm walking through. But listen, can I tell you, I'm thankful that I'm seen and that I'm preaching and that, come on, it's going to take more than this to take me out. Come on, someone say amen. amen. In the thing, I'm thankful. In the thing, I'm thankful. Listen, some things have happened to in the last couple years that were unexpected and unforeseen. But I want to encourage you with something. I mean, come on, this is, a, this is a public service announcement from your friendly neighborhood, Pastor T. <laughs> God's plan for you has not changed because of what has happened in 2020, not because of an election, not because of a pandemic, not because of a financial downturn, not because of inflation. The, God's plan for you, in fact, every plan for your life, every hope, every dream had what's happened in this last year and a half built into it. Didn't catch him off guard. He says, you want to know my will for your life? You just keep rejoicing, praising, praying, and thanking God. Oh, I'm thankful, God. You've seen us through some stuff. They said that was going to take me out. Oh, here I am. I'm still standing.
keeps you moving forward towards God's plans and purposes for your life. In the thing, in the, in the challenge, you can be thankful. Keeps you moving forward to God's will for, for, for your life, for your life. You know how many people, because they lose the spirit of gratitude for who God has made them to be and what he has called them to do because of the spirit of comparison, they never step out or into what God has uniquely called, fashioned, prepared, and shaped you to be and become and to accomplish with your life because you look around and you say, does it really matter? You look around and say, I'm not sure I'm smart enough. You look around and say, I'm not sure I have enough resources to start. Whatever it is, you look around and you compare and you lose the attitude of gratitude for who God has made you uniquely, fearfully, and wonderfully. And I'm telling you, if you got a glimpse of God's heart for the reason he made you just the way you are and for the reason he's making you more into the image of Christ and for the the purpose that he planned before time for you to discover and fulfill on the other side of the cross of Calvary, if you just got a glimpse of it, you would never compare yourself to anyone ever again. Man, how many of you, you, a, a lack, a spirit of, Complaining or grumbling or comparing has kept you from really grabbing a hold of the will of God for your life. Five, it protects our hearts from destructive forces. Protects our hearts from destructive forces. Study after study after study, secular studies. I mean, University of California, Harvard Medical School. You go Google these things and those are a few of the first ones that'll pop up. I'm telling you, not beacons of spirituality and Christianity, for sure. All agree that God's word, what God's word says is true. What's God's word say? It says this, that as you present every situation and petition with thanksgiving to God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It, th- it, it protects your hearts from outside destructive forces that are coming against you to try to discourage you, disappoint you, disappoint you, which means to remove you from the appointment of God for your life, to take you away from those things. There is a protection that comes. The Greek word here where it says guard is the Greek word for reo, and it means to guard or protect by a military-style guard to pre- prevent a hostile invasion or to prevent the inhabitants of a besieged city from taking flight. And he says, when you're thankful, there's a guard that gets on your heart. The enemy comes and he says, well, you're not this and you don't have this and look at them and look at this and what about this and how is this going to turn out? How is this going to pan out? What about this and what about the future and this and that? And you just say, "Woo, I'm just thankful. Thankful, God. Thankful to you, Lord. And it keeps you, those barbs, those arrows, those things that are coming into your life to try to get you derailed or get you unfocused or get you discouraged. You just protect and guard your heart with a spirit, an attitude of gratitude. Man, come on. When you, when you begin to sense an, a scheme of discouragement, come against it in the opposite spirit, which I'm telling you is praise and worship and thankfulness and gratitude towards God for what he's already done in your life and for who he is, regardless of maybe he hasn't shown up yet in your life. It protects our heart from destructive forces. Lastly, last point, we'll close here. An attitude of gratitude, I mean a determination to go beyond an attitude and begin to live in the activity of expressing gratitude to God and to people. It moves the heart of the king. It moves the heart of of the Father. We just read it. It says, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And again, he, he's, he's jealous, but he's not selfish. He's giving you some inside information. He's saying, that when you come before me as a father and you say, thank you, God. Father, thank you that I'm bringing this thing to you and When I'm bringing it to you is not when you're finding out about it, you were there with me in the darkest hour. But I thank you that you care for me. And I thank you that your love and your mercy, they endure forever. Right now it hurts. And right now I'm not sure that I could see in the natural how this is going to work out. But I thank you that you love me. And I thank you that you care for me. And I thank you that you're going to see me through. 
and I thank you that you've already done this and 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 that's a partial list of the things you've already done in my life and I'm thankful for those things. And I'm just telling you, anyone who has kids and those children have come to you proactively without being asked or threatened with discipline and they've proactively come to you and said, hey, I just wanted to say thank you for the new sneakers you bought me. I just want to say thank you for sending me to the football camp. I just want to say thank you for all the things that you've done. I just want to say thank you for working hard to provide for us. I just want, let me tell you, it moves the heart of the father to want to open up. I mean, come on, when that happens to, you, to, to me, it's like, where can I take you and what can I buy you? It moves the heart of the king. It moves the heart of the father, especially when it comes from a place of sincerity. Oh, I might have some challenges, God, but I'm just thankful that I know you, that you love me, that you've saved me. I'm thankful moves the heart of the king. Would you stand? Stand to your feet. Let's respond to God today. I'm just telling you, who's going to grab a hold of this today? It's a game changer in your life. It moves the heart of the king. It moves the heart of the father. This book is a love letter to you. And it's filled with all kinds of promises and assurances and encouragements. It doesn't shy away or mute the difficult moments or the unfortunate seasons. It, de it, de it delves into all of that. This book is God's love letter to you. And it's filled with all kinds of promises for your life, for your future, for your mind, for your heart. And I, I, I don't know about you, I'll just point to myself and say, I'm not sure that I've fully been as thankful to God for everything that is within this book. I mean, what if, what if you received a letter from someone, an earthly person, a, a person, but you knew the person was a good person and you knew the person had a lot of resources. And they wrote you a letter and they said, not because of anything you've done, all you have to do is maybe just kind of do your part of the transaction, just show up and sign the thing. It's what we do for Jesus when we just believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. We, you might have to endorse the check, but that's about all you're gonna have to do. The check is in the mail and it's coming to you, and here's what it's going to do. It's going to pay off the insurmountable debt that you had incurred. And it's not just going to pay off your debt because God, the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't just get us to a zero balance and leave us there. He said, I came to seek and save the lost and deal with the, the issues of your past, but I also came that you would have abundant life. So he says, I'm, I'm, writing, I'm sending you a check. It's not just going to pay off the insurmountable debt that you had incurred, but it's also going to position you with generational wealth and blessing. And, and he said, so uh, the, the check is in the mail. You'll be getting the check. But let's say that you encountered that person before the check had arrived and you had had the opportunity to endorse it, but you knew the person had proven himself time and time, chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter, to be good and to be faithful, even when we weren't. If you knew that was the kind of person you were dealing with, again, the check has not hit your bank account, but you encounter the person, how would you encounter that person? I'm telling you, the way that you encounter the person would have a lot to say and a lot to do with how they viewed you and how much they were encouraged and excited to release to you in the future. I mean, I'm telling you, if I got that letter and I encountered that person, again, I haven't received a dime yet, but I know the nature of the person. I'm telling you, I am saying, I received your letter. I received your letter and I cannot tell you how thankful, how grateful I am because what you alluded to in the letter is true. I have incurred a debt and I'm not sure I can pay it on my own. 
And what I know is that I do have some hopes and some dreams, but what I know is that I can't do it on my own strength. I received your letter, and I got to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just telling you, that gratitude would just, maybe the check was already in the mail. Maybe you were getting it anyways. God has a way of just doing things for people who are even unthankful. But I'm telling you, if that kind of gratitude was expressed, that person would say, I chose wisely choosing to send that inheritance to that person. Man, God's word is the letter. I'm paying your debts. I'm setting you up for the future I have for you. Come on, let's say thank you to him. Let's say thank you. Lord, we say thank you. Right where you are, man of God, woman of God, just begin to just find, maybe you're going through a difficult time, a rough patch. Maybe it's going to require some faith. That's, that's okay. We live by faith and not by sight. We, we walk by faith and not by the feelings or emotions that we're going through. We say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And as you're saying thank you before we sing one more time and get you out about your day, I want to give you the opportunity today if you're here and you're far from God. You're here and you're far from God. You're here and you're weighed down by the, by the debt that you've incurred. Maybe you once knew God and served God. You've drifted. You're a prodigal son or daughter. Or maybe you've never put your hope and your faith in Jesus Christ and had the weight of your sin and all the guilt and shame and condemnation that the enemy tries to use to beat you up and keep you in time out, keep you in the corner of life. Either way or anywhere in between, if that's you today, this is your moment. This is your moment to say yes to Jesus, to say yes to Jesus. If that's you, come on, I'm going to ask you to do something very simple, but it's profound and powerful. I just want to ask you to just lift your hand towards God. It's an outward sign of an inward work, just lift your hand high and say, that's me, Pastor T, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need forgiveness. I need a fresh start. I need a new life. If you're joining us online, I think it would be powerfully important for you. You might even be by yourself, but you're never alone. You might even want to pull the car to the side of the road. You might even want to take a stand off of the couch or from the chair you're sitting at from behind your desk and just take a moment, just lift your hand high towards heaven because you're not responding to a person, a preacher. You're responding to your father. And here's what we're going to do. If you raise your hand, you can lower it. We're going to pray this prayer with you. And maybe we'll do it today with a little bit of fresh perspective and gratitude. And, and we do it every week for two reasons. To quickly show the people who are responding that there's a church family that wants to come alongside them, encourage them, equip them, help them in their fresh faith in Jesus. And two, we do it because it just reminds us every week, church family, we, we're growing in our faith. We're maturing in our faith. We're not staying stuck. We're moving on. We're going deeper. We're going beyond. But anything that God does in our life is always going to be built on the foundation of grace. So come on, let's pray it. Pray it with me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a Savior. I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. I give you my life. I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, come on, say this with a shout. I will never be the same. And then put your hands together with gratitude for what Jesus has done in your life. Hey, come on, let's sing together. Let's sing together. Come on, with maybe some fresh perspective and conviction today. Let's give him thanks for who he is.